Phyrexia is back! Magic's original, infectious, flesh-warping, indoctrinating Big Bad is the current Big Bad again. They've been about almost since Magic's beginning in one form or another, and they want to make your flesh metal and your metal flesh. And if that doesn't sound appealing, they've got the perfect concoction to help you see things their way. A forcibly expanding cult of transformed fanatics who won't rest until the entire multiverse is remade to match their vision of perfection. They've been reappearing for a little while now, but early this year, this month even, that's contextual, they're gonna really, really be back, because we're gonna be back there. New Phyrexia, the plane, has been out there, off camera, just behind the planes in our focus, looming over the rest of the multiverse for 11 years now, and this year will be the first time we've seen it since. Last time we were there, New Phyrexia was isolated from Magic's other worlds. The Phyrexians unable to planeswalk or otherwise leave the plane and spread their vision of Phyrexian perfection to the rest of the multiverse. That's all changed in the years since, and Phyrexia is ready to set its sights outward and once again become a threat to every plane there is. But for that to happen, for Phyrexia to get to their current ominous state, one world had to fall first. One world has already succumbed to the glory of Phyrexia and already been completed. Mirrodin was the former name of the world of New Phyrexia. The name it had when it first appeared almost 20 years ago. The glistening world of metal was my favourite plane and had a storied history of its own and the seeds of the current iteration of Phyrexia can be found amongst its annals. But most importantly, it's where the Mir are from! Magic's little beak-headed robot guys, unique to Mirrodin. Look at them! They're amazing! They're not only the best creature type in the game, but also the best thing in Magic. Why are they not more of a big deal? They're like literally objectively better than Slivers in every conceivable way, and yet the Slivers have five Wooburg commanders and there's not even one legendary Mir. What the hell? Mirrodin is effectively gone now, transformed, and all but the last of its original denizens share the same fate. But a tiny thread of hope winds on. And so in preparation for Phyrexia, all will be one, and in fear of what might happen in it, we're going to run down Mirrodin's history right from the beginning. In varying amounts of detail, from the original set's release, through Scar's block, the Shadow Years, and all the way up through the recent era till today. With a brief foray into the past and far too much emphasis on the Mir. But then, I am a Silver Mir, so... What did you expect? Guildless 3 is next! I know, I know, I'm sorry. I wish there were two of me so we could make things quicker and then have sex. I just had to get this video out before all will be one. There was a poll about it. I made a poll. You didn't see the poll? Ah. But Guildless 3 will be two videos. I'll talk about it at the end again. But for now, join me for as deep of a dive as I can get into under the time frame on my favorite corner of magic lore, despite how repeatedly bad the associated stories often are. The lore's still good though. Let's get into it. I would usually introduce myself here, but I don't feel like saying my name for some reason, so it's in a different video. Or just guess it. On with the thing! Mirrodin. 2003 saw the release of Mirrodin, and the beginning of the era we're arguably still in, wherein Magic's original and primary setting, Dominaria, would be left behind so that the game could explore the vastness of its multiverse. Mirrodin was a metal world, both in the style of the retro fantasy art its aesthetic evoked, and in that it was an artificial plane made out of metal. Great trees of copper coloured green with verdigris, chrome islands dotting a vast quicksilver sea. Rolling plains of hexagonal plates, covered in grass sharp enough to take your fingers off. It's harsh. Since its beginning, Magic's aesthetic had incorporated more sci-fi elements than your typical Tolkien-esque fantasy, but Mirrodin would see the game delve deeper into that pool than ever before. Sci-fi was actually something the original Mirrodin style guide prompted artists to avoid too heavily, as Mirrodin was intended to still be fantasy foremost. But with its abstract environments, organic life infused with metal, and the abundance of magical automatons, they're not robots, okay? The style guide says. All bathed in the neon wash of the five coloured mana suns, Mirrodin struck a more futuristic visage than we'd seen of any Magic the Gathering set. The brand new card frame, premiering in the core set just before, now for the first time in Black Border, sold this feeling even more. Mirrodin holds a controversial place in the minds of many older Magic the Gathering players. Not for the world building, most people seem to be into that, but the artifact themed block came with a bunch of unbalanced, overpowered cards that damaged the game's meta to the point where a bunch of people just stopped playing. Until Ravnica showed up a couple years later to get them all back in. At the time, I had no idea any of this was happening, and to me, Mirrodin was perfect. 
I couldn't tell you exactly when I first got into Magic, but it would have been sometime between the releases of Odyssey and Scourge. My dad bought me and my brother a tournament pack of Odyssey from the toy bit in Boswell's. It's not around anymore. Sad. And in the cafe of a nearby bookshop, we poured over the cards. This brand new, but somehow also ancient, segmented tome of lore. Each one a sliver of another world. A window to somewhere else. A tiny piece of a puzzle too grand to complete. We had no idea how to actually play the game, but we were so fascinated by these cards that we invented games for them. I wouldn't learn how to actually play Magic until we were given a Starter 2000 two-player set with CD-ROM not long after, and the first booster I bought, a little while later when some friends got into it, was from Scorch. It was supposed to be a dragon-themed set. These are the only dragons in the whole set. This is the only dragon I ever got, and I will cherish him forever. I don't know where Eternal Witness is. He's not... I know I said I cherish him forever, but he's he's up he's upstairs somewhere. He's not in the deck. I'm sorry, sorry, Eternal Dragon. I said witness. As much as I loved and got into Magic, mostly because of the art and the world building, I didn't know a lot about the world that was being built. The tournament pack came with an insert that we must have immediately lost because I don't remember ever reading it. I loved digging into this world through the tiny slices that I had of it, and every time I saw one character on two cards, the gears in my head span even faster. But I knew this wasn't my world. There was clearly a breadth and history to what I was seeing that I felt like I was barely scratching the surface of. And whilst I definitely would have kept cracking Scourge packs anyway to get those damn dragons. Where the hell are they? The set symbol is literally a dragon. It wasn't until the next set that I truly fell in love. Mirrodin was new and bright and bold and mine. Not only was this a brand new world, I gathered as much from the insert that came with the tournament pack that I didn't lose this time. I had never seen anything like it. I don't think Young Me had seen anything dipping its toes so completely into science fiction and fantasy aesthetics up to that point, or at least doing it so uniquely. And the idea of the place just captured me so much. A world of metal, where the parts that make it up are so strange yet still familiar. Abstracted through this one fundamental change, but still recognisable enough to let your imagination run. The wanderlust for the world within the cards had never been so strong, and I wanted more cards just so I could see more of Mirrodin. All of that is to say I find it very difficult to be unbiased when it comes to the topic of Mirrodin, as it's all saturated with the tastiest of nostalgia. I'm Mirren to the core. But that shouldn't affect your opinion of my opinion in this lore opiniony thing, right? That's a weird thing to feel so strongly about. Quit being weird. Watch the video. Mirrodin the setting was crafted as the mathematically perfect Metal World Argentum by the ye olde planeswalker Khan, the Silver Golem. I always unconsciously say Golem when reading that word, but I'll try and pronounce it correctly. To watch over the perfect world that he'd made and populated with some golem friends slash children, Khan re-sculpted a powerful artifact that he had into a guy to be the warden of the plane. Khan then bounced to do some planeswalker shit and left his world in the capable hands of his new warden, Memnarch. But Memnarch went mad! Mad, I tell you! Mad! He immediately renamed the place to Mirrodin after his previous form, the Mirari, and set Khan's golem kids to work terraforming the plane away from its creator's minimalist vision and into the replica of the natural world that we saw in 2003. Mirrodin's surface was reshaped into five sections, each a facsimile of the type of terrain you'll find on any basic land, one for each colour of mana. Once the golems were done reshaping the place, Memnark killed them all, so that no one would know the nature of this world but him. Across Mirrodin's history, the mana core at its centre periodically destabilised and spat out a small sun for each colour of mana, influencing the plane's development further as they orbited around it. Memnarch wanted his metal world to be able to support life, you see, and he wanted life to fill this insane terrarium. Using magical soul traps, he snatched a bunch of unsuspecting bystanders and wildlife from the myriad worlds of Magic's multiverse, and teleported them to Mirrodin to populate his plane. Over generations, the captured inhabitants grew into the civilizations that we saw in the block. The white-aligned hills and fields of the Razorgrass that ran across Mirrodin for miles were home to a few of the plains' cultures. The pride of the Leonian cat people were the leading civilization in the Razor Fields, and their home was the area's biggest landmark, the ancient den Taj Nar. A martial people, they liked equipment, and they rode pterodactyls. The Loxodon elephant folk also called the Razor Fields home. A hardy and stubborn lot with a harsh sense of morality and a notoriously unwavering perspective. The Aurioch were the humans who lived amongst the fields, in a collection of small, semi-aligned cities. Boasting neither the unity nor the military strength of the Leonin, the Aurioch were a resourceful and resilient people nonetheless. Mirrodin's Quicksilver Sea was pierced by many silver spires, 
connected by constructed walkways. These spires were often hollowed out into buildings on the inside, and primarily occupied by the Vidalcan and their Neuroc lessers. The Vidalcan were inherently blue beings with forearms and intensely logical minds. They would evolve away the need for liquid holding breathing tanks in the next block style guide, but in the OG, they all sported them. Lumengrid was their capital, and thanks to a mysterious benefactor, spoilers, it's Memnarch, the Vidalcan were the most advanced and likely the most powerful race on the plane. The human Neuroc were their indentured underclass, who the Vidalcan kept in line with artificially grown drone men. The Neuroc lived as second-class citizens in Vidalcan cities, or in their own poorer settlements on the coast. Understandably, the least occupied of Mirrodin's biomes were the necrotic, leaden swamps of the Mephedros. Most that did occupy them were zombies, called the Nim. The fumes of the swamp slowly killed and reanimated anyone who breathed them in for too long, also seemingly causing metallic growths over the eyes. The Nim stalked the swamps mindlessly for prey, and were often corralled and put to work or war by necromancers of the human Moriok clans, who lived short lives at the edge of the Mephedros. The largest of these clans was the only one to occupy the middle of the swamp, the Vault of Whispers, Ishsar. Mirrodin's goblins were more unified than those found on most plains, and they lived in the rusted mountains of the Exeda chain. They believed Mirrodin was the great steel mother that all life had come from, and that all life must be returned to. So they loved throwing stuff into furnaces to be reborn, as machinery and kitchen utensils and the like. The largest of these forges was the Great Furnace, the hollow mountain called Dotha. The goblins were perhaps the most dramatic redesign in the second block style guide, so the later goblins have these large, distinctive heads. The isolationist humans of the Volshock tribes also occupied the Iron Mountains. Perhaps the most physically adapted of all Mirrodin's human groups to the harsh environment they lived in, the Volshock's hardy bodies made them excellent warriors, weaponsmiths, and pyro slash geomancers. Depicted here, none of those things. I always think of lightning as like pyromancy because of Avatar, but I, whatever. The giant copper trees of Mirrodin's vast forest, the Tangle, were home to the civilization of the Trolls and the Elves. Built up around the largest tree, Tel Jalad, the Trolls were the reclusive elders of the society, and dictated through magic which parts of their history the Elves were allowed to remember. Despite or maybe because of this, their society operated in relative sylvan harmony for a long time before turmoil would see the Trolls removed later on. Green is the colour that wants to kill Artifice the most, and the Elves reflected this through their rejection of technology. The Tangle was also home to a small number of druidic humans called the Silvok. They only had two cards in the original block, but one of them was Eternal Witness. Large-scale conflict wasn't particularly common between Mirrodin's cultures at this time, but they would typically clash where their territories met. On top of all the sentient beings Memnarch yanked to the plain, he also brought a bunch of wildlife, and stuff that's neither here nor there, like ogres. Memnarch wanted Mirrodin to be the real deal, with its own functioning ecosystem, so abducted animals, beasts, dragons, and etc. all called Mirrodin home. Outside of anyone's control, Mirrodin's influence had an effect on the physiology of all of its inhabitants, causing metal to grow naturally on their bodies. Like on many planes, the influence of mana, like from Mirrodin's five mana sons, also causes new life like angels and elementals to be born, and Mirrodin's took on a distinctly Mirrodin form. The plane was crawling with artifact creatures, many naturally occurring, but many more crafted by an unseen creator. Scholars say that arbiters exist on every world, created by an unknown hand to enforce justice. Though the majority's creator was unseen only to Mirrodin's people. I bloody love Memnarg. The Mirrodin book series is fine. They're pretty good books for the most part that don't light my world on fire, but Memnarg is absolutely the highlight. He's constantly high on mind-expanding serum, which he believes makes him godly, but is also losing its intensity, a fact that drives him mad, and he has this assistant that is basically just a clone of his humanoid parts, except entirely metal, and Memnarch just hates him, because he wants to be entirely metal, and can't be. Whenever he decides he doesn't like a section of Mirrodin, he just bulldozes it with unstoppable death engines before reshaping it anew. An imperfection in the perfect world? We can't allow that. By the end of the novels, he's turned the entire plane into a giant engine with the sole job of giving him what he wants, a planeswalker spark. Memnarch idolised his creator, Khan, and wanted nothing more than to be like him. In the midst of his madness, Memnarch managed to lock Khan out of the plane, whilst convincing himself that Khan had abandoned him. Or that he was there all along? 
I'm confused, but so was Memnarch. The Warden set his demented focus to the goal of joining his creator in traversing the planes, for which he would need that elusive Planeswalker Spark. That rare latent power that very few sentient creatures across Magic's multiverse are born with, and fewer still, ever activate. Becoming a Planeswalker and gaining the ability to traverse the fucking- I can't remember the end of this fucking sentence- fuck! Ah, oh, I did so well! Becoming a planeswalker and gaining the ability to travel between Magic's various planes. Memnarch figured that if he could cultivate life here on Mirrodin, then eventually someone would be born with a spark that he could take. So Memnarch let his abducted inhabitants find their places in his world and grow into the civilizations that we saw in the block. Gradually shaping his perfect plane, often quietly, sometimes loudly, from his citadel at the heart of the hollow world. Mirrodin is hollow, by the way. He was the unseen master of Mirrodin able to view anywhere on it from the tower of his citadel, the Darksteel Eye, the centre of his grand panopticon. But when Memnarch's many eyes peered through the many eyes of the Darksteel Eye, whose eyes was Memnarch seeing through? It's not a riddle, I mean, how did he look out of his tower? What were his little screens connected to? The answer is more cute than you might think. The Mir. The Mir were Memnarch's servants. Little robot- no! Robot, sorry, the style guide. Little, magical automaton guys with adorably oversized beak-shaped heads, crafted from various metals and given, not life, but automation and a purpose by their creator, crazy old Mr. Memnarch. Each was designed with a specific task in mind and constructed with the singular purpose of fulfilling that task. Terraforming, channeling energy, having arms. Make a Mir for a job and have it do that job. That's what the Mir were there for. Memnarch favoured having a lot of Mir over a few, and the name used by Watsi for the little automatons referenced the Greek word for ant, as well as the Myrmidon, loyal subordinates of Greek myth. The Mir were envisioned as small, numerous workers, and these ideas were baked into their construction. Memnarch created the Mir with three qualities in mind. Dependability, controllability, and disposability. Most of the original Mir cards share these design principles. They're all artifacts, they're mostly small, they usually do something specific and useful, and there's a fair few of them. There were also a number of Mir token generators in the original Mirrodin block, churning out many a mini Mir and furthering the idea of their numerousness. Whilst a few Mir cards were bad even by the standards of the era, a lot of them are still playable today, giving you that small, specific effect your deck needs. The five original mana Mir, each tapping for one of the five colours, exemplify the Mir in function and form. Useful then and today, at least in EDH if you want lots of creatures and you're not running green, and each one brought to life by Kev Walker's capable, capable hands. There's very little of the original Mirrodin style guide online, and the only page we have for the Mir comes from the next Mirrodin block. The idea for Mirrodin was slowly built out across the team that was making it, and the block's art director was Jeremy Cranford, with Matthew Wilson as the lead concept artist. So these are the people likely responsible for the design of the Mir. The beak-shaped head is the most recognisable element of any Mir, and the most common aspect amongst them, but the Mir's designs are broad enough to reflect their created, functional nature. Some Mir aren't even small, although Mark Rosewater, the block's design lead, did consider Mir Enforcer to be a flavour fail, as a comparatively massive 4-4. But I like chalking the Enforcer's existence up to Memnarch's paranoia, anyway. Most Mir monitor other species. Some Mir monitor other Mir. Adaptable in construction to be specialised in function. I really wish we could get a look at that Mir style guide page as the most common design amongst them that became their iconic look clearly came from the guide. The little bipedal dudes with blank mysterious eyes and a larger circle at the back of the beak head are painted by a lot of the blocks artists and clearly all reference the same source. And I just love them. I love them so much. Let's get a look at the Mana Mir again. Oof. They're gorgeous. I can't handle them. I think Silver Mir might be my favourite magic piece still, even after all these years. What a surprise. It's perfect. It's a perfect image. My brain likes it when my eyes look at this. Kev Walker's iconic high-contrasted detailing on our foregrounded Mir balanced against the haze of the background, obscured by the storm. In the distance, a singular lightning bolt strikes the Quicksilver Sea, and I can't help but hear the rain and the crack of thunder. There's so much mood and secrecy to the piece. So much calm and crackling with untapped potential. More so than any other magic locale, to me, Mirrodin is the plane most ripe for adventure, most brimming with secrets to discover. The feeling of solitude that accompanied so many of Mirrodin's creatures and abstract environments, coupled with its nature as a mad wizard's terrarium collection, 
created a sense of a microcosm of the multiverse, where anything from within it could be found. Secrets from a thousand worlds all lonely through displacement. In their isolated mystery, the Mir exemplify Mirrodin, and Silvermere exemplifies them both. The Vidal can saw the Mir as toys, unaware of the intelligence lurking behind their empty eyes. The majority of Mir were given the task of scouting Mirrodin, and observing Memnarch's plane-bound captives fledgling civilizations. And while Spy sat at the top of the task list of many a Mir, that was a role that any one of them could play. From his tower at the heart of the world, Memnarch could peer through the eyes of any Mir on a whim, and see their vision projected in the Darksteel Eye, giving him a near-omnipresent view of his world through his legion of walking CCTV cameras, providing that crucial piece of his self-imposed godhood on the plane. All Memnarch had to do now was sit in his tower, send out the occasional town-crushing behemoth, and wait for the spark haver to be born. And she was! An elf named Glissa, native to Mirrodin, descendant of an elf nicked from somewhere else, was eventually born with the Planeswalker Spark Memnarch craved. She's the hero of the Mirrodin story, the protagonist of the books, and her and her gradually acquired ragtag team of rebels go on an adventure across Mirrodin to discover the unseen master of their world, before struggling against him to bring him down and free the plane. In the books, the Mir don't feature prominently, but show up a few times skulking behind the heroes to remind the reader that Memnarch is still watching. Despite Memnarch's grand designs, and he does a bunch of fucked up shit, ramping up his efforts dramatically before the end of the novels, coming down hard on Mirrodin's people with immense force before deciding to use all of their souls to power his big Planeswalker Spark Converter. Which he does, effectively wiping out the plane. Don't worry, everyone got resurrected. Memnarch even tortured, dismembered, and mentally broke one of our main heroes, the genius goblin Slobad. I've heard people say Slobad before, but I don't like that pronunciation. I'm saying Slobad. Before hooking him into a giant machine and forcing him to reshape the plane's interior into the big spark converter. This is like the second to main character who we've spent hundreds of pages with that this happens to, and it's such a bleak, grisly, disturbing fate. I love it. Regardless, the heroes of the story defeat Memnarch in a desperate struggle. But unfortunately, despite him being tackled by Glissa into the mana core of the plane center, Memnarch's spark converter goes off anyway. With Memnarch and Glissa both vaporized by the core, the spark has nowhere to go but into the poor goblin Slobad. All other sentient life on the plane is destroyed in the process. But it's cool, because now that Memnarch's dead, Khan can show up again, and he does, and he uses the spark, which Slobad readily gives up, to make it so that everyone is not dead, and alive again, and even sends a bunch of them back to their original worlds that they were taken from ages ago. Hooray! Everyone lives, the good guys win, the plane celebrates. The honor is mine, Lady Bruenna, Rapture said. We are pleased to finally meet you. Wait, that's the last line of the books? A line about how two supporting characters never met? Why is that the last line in the book? Mirrodin is left without his warden for the first time in a long time, and finally, the plane is free. I kind of wish Memnarch's plan had just been less catastrophic, and succeeded, and he'd left Mirrodin behind and gone on to become a great recurring villain. But it's fine. Like, his plan didn't have to involve everyone dying. What's he just wanted to raise the stakes in a Margin Boo kind of way. The heroes prevail, I guess, and Memnarch is one of the few people that Khan doesn't bring back to life. He just turns him back into orb mode and then chucks the orb to Glitter and Slobad, and then leaves again to do more Planeswalker shit. So great, the bad guy's an orb now, the heroes pull a win right out the graveyard, and all those civilizations are now free at last. Story's over, all of them are good, but what of the poor wee Mir? The implication from the end of the last novel was pretty disconcerting. None of the constructs work, except these little guys. The goblin let a small Memnarch-like artifact scuttle up one arm and down the other. So apparently every magical automaton, save for the Memnites that hang out in the core, is now lifeless. That's pretty great news when it comes to those levelers and eaters of dazes, but are all the Mir just dead too? Seems like it. I'm heartbroken. And that's how we left the Mir at the end of the original Mirrodin. Apparently entirely wiped out. A short, sad existence for a group of cute, not-robot henchmen. That's the tale of the Mir? It can't be. That's not allowed. Let's take our collective outrage all the way to the next part. Future Glimpse Future Sight was the third set of the Time Spiral block, wherein planar rifts were making everything go crazy and opening portals all over Dominaria to different time periods and alternate realities. It was a weird cool block with a mishmash of weird cool stuff. The mishmash 
being the theme. By Future Sight, the future itself was the major theme, and many cards sported a new and never again used card frame to sell the idea that what we were seeing were possible futures for magic. And exactly one of those possible futures featured exactly one Mia! This Mia! Sarkamite Mia! Although Sarkamite Mia is not looking quite how we remember them. A horrible sight, yes, but the sounds. Its twanging tendons and grinding gears are almost musical. Brudiclad, Telcor engineer. Not only has someone gone and glued wings to his back, but he's also all spiky and fleshy in parts. Lots of Mirrodin's natural life was suffused with metal, but outside of a few examples, the non-living constructs weren't suffused with flesh. And definitely not the Mir. Never the Mir. Neither the name Brudiclad nor Telcor had appeared before in Magic's history, so those offered no further conclusions on the nature of this strange meaty Mir. But many Magic players had a pretty good idea of exactly what had happened to this poor little guy, and what this card might represent for the future of the Mir and Mirrodin itself. For there was more to Mirrodin's construction than I just revealed. A minor detail that I skipped over. A tiny stain at its very beginning that seeped through the plane's entire history. And to understand that, we'll have to go a bit further back into the games. Phyrexia. Phyrexia were the main villains of Magic the Gathering for many long years and again today. Almost as old as the game itself, first being mentioned in Magic's second ever expansion, Antiquities, back in 1994. The warm rain of grease on my face immediately made it clear I had entered Phyrexia. Jar... Jar Seal... Jar Seal? Jar Seal Diary. The greasy rain and the art of the few Phyrexian cards that there were set the tone for the weirdness and the wrongness that would follow. What Phyrexia actually was would be built out over years across the books and sets that released as they grew into Magic's primary villains. Phyrexia was another artificial plane. Also kind of hollow, but nowhere near as nice as lovely shiny Mirrodin. Apparently in its distant past it didn't look too different from Mirrodin, but it was repurposed by Yorgmoth, a doctor from a highly advanced civilization on Dominaria. Many thousands of years ago, the scheming Yorgmoth little-fingered his way into the ruling council of the Thran Empire, taking control of public health and funneling an ever-increasing number of potentially sick patients through a portal to his medical refuge plane. Yorgmoth treated his patients by changing and replacing parts of their failing bodies with artifice, a process he called phyresis. The advanced Thran Empire was eventually destroyed by a civil war that Yorgmoth started, and the survivors of the fallen Thran capital had nowhere to flee but into that same portal to Phyrexia. He took on an increasingly godlike role on Phyrexia, both in his accrued power and in the reverence of his warped test subjects. Like the most horrifying version of Memnarch, Yorgmoth was the god of his own mini-plane, and over millennia it was transformed into a vision of hell, rendered in flesh and metal. Nine spheres made up the interior of Phyrexia, each horrific and serving some horrific function in the process of perfecting Yorgmoth's vision of life. He, and by extension all Phyrexians, wanted to spread Phyresis to all living things, to improve them with superior artifice. They called this completion with an E-A, and to be complete, and to complete others, was something every Phyrexian desired. Yorgmoth and his researchers even managed to create a viral contagion that would warp the body towards completion and force the mind to align with Yorgmoth's doctrine. The infectious glistening oil was Phyrexia distilled into an essence and became one of their primary tools in their goal of completing the multiverse and seeing their vision for superior life installed everywhere. Phyrexia have always been great villains and I think they work even better today than they did back then. Magic Story's greatest strength is just how vast and varied its setting is and how many unique settings make it up. What monster could be more terrible than one that wants to make them all the same? I'm not going to run down Phyrexia's entire history as it would take forever and you can find that elsewhere, but it's worth noting a couple of things. That portal between Dominaria and Phyrexia that Yorgmoth used back in the day was thankfully closed soon after the Thran fell, locking Phyrexia away as Phyrexians were both unable to planeswalk or to complete planeswalkers. For millennia the Phyrexians were simply stuck on their plane, itching to spread across the multiverse by way of Dominaria. That portal was briefly reopened by two Dominarian brothers, and that caused a whole load of bad for their plane. But the Phyrexians were still mostly stuck on Phyrexia. All the while, Phyrexia fucked around with other portals and the like, trying to breach Dominaria. Throughout the 90s and the early 2000s, Phyrexia loomed in the background and had a couple of skirmishes with Magic's cast of heroes. But eventually Phyrexia said, fuck portals anyway, and just phased another plane full of their troops 
into Dominaria to invade it. And they uh, also kept using Pauls. In 2001, that full-scale, plane-phasing assault that had been impending for years finally happened, and Phyrexia invaded Dominaria en masse. Over three sets, a desperate struggle was fought as the planes were at war, and it was a big ol' event. Continents were morphed, heroes died, people made really questionable character turns at really inopportune moments, but ultimately, the good guys won, and Dominaria was saved. Despite turning himself into a sentient cloud of death, Yorgmoth was killed, the Phyrexians defeated, and Phyrexia the Plane was destroyed. All's well that ends well, eh? But wait! Phyrexia is the main MTG villain right now! The Praetors are showing up everywhere, Dominaria has been invaded again, and the first set this year is called Phyrexia, all will be won. How's all that true if they all blew up? Remember the silver golem planeswalker that made Mirrodin and then showed up again at the end to Jesus everyone back to life? Well, Khan was originally built as a tool in the Dominarian effort against Phyrexia. Urza, the planeswalker who made Khan, used a Phyrexian heartstone when making him. An object Phyrexians used to give some of their creations sentience. That's why Khan can think and feel and love, etc. But Urza apparently didn't scrub that Phyrexian heartstone well enough before installing it, and it still contains traces of that glistening Phyrexian contagion oil. By the time that Khan had built Mirrodin, Phyrexia was no more and all the Phyrexians were long dead. But that oil was still alive in Khan's heart, and whilst he was immune to its effects, the oil had other plans in mind. Divide and grow. Divide and grow. That was the first rule. Divide and grow until the oil infused the entire world. There was time enough for contamination and control later. For now, it must simply divide and grow. As Khan left Mirrodin in the care of the new warden, he also left behind a single black spot on the ground. Hating imperfections, Memnarch quickly spied it and wiped it away. Problem solved. The oil had already insinuated itself into the warden's psyche, but there was time enough later to exert control. It was the glistening oil that led Memnarch down the path of madness that turned Argentum into Mirrodin. The oil led Memnarch to terraform the plane to support life and to bring life to it. But the oil sank even deeper into the heart of the world. Does the suffusion of metal in the flesh of Mirrodin's inhabitants remind you of anything? Over time, the oil's influence caused giant fungal growths in the core. The towering mycosynth spread spores across the plane, changing the physiology of its inhabitants, causing metal to grow naturally on all living beings. And also for some of the constructs to become more fleshy, but you don't see it as much outside of the books. This wasn't completion as the Phyrexians understood it. The influence of the Mycosynth didn't come with the infectious religious doctrine that direct contact with the oil has, and the metallic growths it caused seemed mostly to be external and less encompassing than true phyresis. But the oil's goal back then was to divide and grow until it had suffused the entire world, and by the time of the original Mirrodin block, with generations born under the effect of the Mycosynth, that goal had been accomplished. In its smallest form, Yorgmoth's influence had survived and made it to a new world ripe for completion. Mirrodin was being primed to be transformed again. Under the surface, under everyone's noses, the foundations for a new Phyrexia were being built. The rest of the video was shot a little while ago when my beard was much longer and shaggier than I realized it was. And to be honest, if I had the time, I would just reshoot that as well. But I don't have the time and my acceptance of me being annoyed about that is something that will tie in with the theme at the end of the video. Wait and see. Scars of Mirrodin We didn't return to Mirrodin until 2010, leaving a whole six years that we had to live with, with the uncertainty of the Mir's survival. Scars of Mirrodin was maybe the first big sequel that Watsi has made in the modern era, a thing they do fairly regularly now with varying results. Scars of Mirrodin block had a few goals, and among them was being a successful sequel to the original Mirrodin, which was an artifact-themed set with flavour people really liked that sold really well, but also messed up the game with a bunch of powerful cards that had to be banned. So they wanted to do the first bit without that second bit happening again. And they were really successful at that first bit, and even at avoiding the second for two whole sets until the third set in the block came out and introduced a bunch of powerful cards that had to be banned. But the flavour was still on point, and Mirrodin was back in all its shimmering glory. The Quicksilver Sea, the Razor Grass Fields, the cats and elves and shit, it's all here. It's been over a hundred in-universe years since we last saw Mirrodin, and some Mirrens, we call them Mirrens now, have undergone some changes in the style guide, but they're mostly for the better, and Mirrodin's returned to us almost as we knew her. The outcome of the last Mirrodin book was confusing. It made it sound like the vast majority of Mirrodin's people got sent back to their original worlds or the worlds of their ancestors when Khan resurrected everyone. 
But don't waste time thinking about that, because it was retconned anyway. Now, what actually happened at the end of the original Mirrodin block was that whilst everyone was resurrected, only the original plain napped Mirrans were sent back home, leaving all their Mirrodin born descendants behind. And the retcon was nice, because it meant we could have a Mirrodin sequel on a Mirrodin that actually has people on it. But also it doesn't make much sense, because generations were born on Mirrodin anyway, so wouldn't the first generation have mostly died out? Whatever, it was a problem for some of the longer living races, and Mirrodin societies have been chugging on between blocks just without the influence of their elders. The formerly united Leonin split down the middle into two clans, one venerating their absent leaders and their old ways, and the other desperate to bring about a new form of order. The blue Neuroc humans rose up against their Vidalcan oppressors, but after a bloody conflict and a tense truce, only managed to eke out a slightly larger fraction of power in the two species joint society. In the Mephidros, the undead Nim stood briefly frozen in place, sleeping after the fall of Memnarch. When they reawakened, they attacked the unprepared Moriok humans en masse, causing heavy casualties. The red Volshok societies were structured around their smithing, and the unexplained weakening of the ore they pulled from the mountains spread division between them. The troll elders of the primary green Mirren society were all first generation, and almost all of them got returned, alongside half of the elves. Leaving the remaining Telgelad elves struggling to restructure, perhaps the most affected by the vanishing of all Mirrodin's cultures. Additionally, and most importantly, the fate of the automatons has also been reckoned. Scars of Mirrodin is just as packed with magical, definitely not robot automatons as the original Mirrodin was. This retcon isn't given as much of an explanation, and I'm sure that some of the constructs and golems that we're seeing have been built or otherwise magically came into being since last block, but we know that some of them are definitely still kicking around since last time. See, Gemini Engine was a card from last block that split into two, and this one's a soliton because he's lonely now. And maybe even some of those golems that Khan made ages ago when he made the place might have somehow survived despite supposedly all being killed by Memnarch. They're called Precursor Golems. They look very carny. They look like things that Khan makes. But the point is the robots are fine, goddammit, and they're not robots. They're all back and fine and not lifeless, and that includes the best ones. The Mia are back! Ugh, oh, I can finally exhale. It's been six years. Scar's Block gave us 15 brand new Mia and a bunch of new Mia makers. The new Mia follow the design principles of the originals. They're numerous small artifact creatures offering small specific effects. Most of the Mir cards were new, but the Mana Mir returned to provide the mana backbone they did in the original block. With new art by Alan Pollock that references the new designs from the Style Guide page that we actually get to see this time. I'm personally still more a fan of the Kev Walker cycle, but taking the most iconic Mir and refacing them with a non-standard look gives us a greater impression of visual variance amongst the Mir on the whole. They're seemingly as numerous as they were before, with even more token generators, and they've even been given more consideration as a tribe this time around. They have a lord now, a guy that gives them plus one plus one, and a bunch of cards that benefit you from having a ton of Mir. Like this giant ball of Mir that will roll over your enemies even better the more Mir you have. Do the Mir like being a ball? Did someone do this to them, or are the Mir just into this? It's a question without an answer, and one that comes up a lot in reference to many Mir in the sequel block. They were Memnarch's servants, and built to perform whatever function he designated them. With Memnarch gone, what do the Mir even do on Mirrodin? The Mir are like rusted metal. Gleaming purpose hidden by a thin disguise of debris. From the information that could be pieced together at the time, we can see that the Mir have gone from being the tools of Memnarch to the tools of anyone enterprising enough to control them. Memnarch designed some Mir to follow the levelers and reaffix lost parts. Mir and partisans put that instinct to good use. However many of these Mir are Memnarch originals is unclear, but we can see that new Mir are being made on the plane through numerous means. Another new tribal card, Mir Reservoir, and the article that's attached to it, gave us a greater sense of the Mir on the whole in Scars of Mirrodin. Doug Byer's article describes how the reservoirs act as safe houses, factories, and cemeteries to the Mir. Dotting the face of Mirrodin and leading down to the plain center, mana flares from the core travel up the reservoirs to the surface. The reservoir's exterior trenches are littered with the broken bodies of dead Mir as they attract dying Mir like an elephant graveyard. The card itself can make you mana to make a Mir with, or bring a Mir back from the bin, so in-game and otherwise, the reservoir was the perfect place to craft up some Mir. The reservoir is often used by artificers and industrious Mir alike to build Mir legions. So whilst many Mir are the newly constructed, chosen tools of Mir and artificers, we can also see that some Mir are building each other. Propagating just like any other race on the plane, and gathering together to survive and combine their mysterious efforts in ways that observers fail to understand. 
We can't quite determine what they're doing, but they seem to be doing it quite well. Vidalcan Research Notes Perhaps the intelligence lurking behind the eyes of Silvermere wasn't just their hidden masters. Maybe outside of Memnarch's control, some Mere have begun to find a purpose on their own. The Mere Reservoir is a point of inspiration. Mere are more than just mindless automatons. They have a subtle intellect that hides beneath their devotion to duty. The Reservoir is a symbol to the Mere, a gathering place and an institution, and a reminder of their identity as a true Mirren race. Ah, oh, yeah, see? That! Exactly that! I know this text is from an extraneous article, but it gives us everything we need to put the mere in context. They may be most comfortable following a leader's given task, but some mere want to find out what it means to be mere outside that control. Maybe they'll even find out together in adorable little mere societies. We're given small explanation for the mere's gatherings or activities overall in Scar's blog, but the mystery of the original mere is retained. Only the mere know what the mere get up to, and that's just great. They're a true Mirren race now, not just someone's puppets. They're doing mere type things and making new friends. Uh, that's a little strange, but they're getting up to adorable antics like murder. Ooh, that doesn't look very friendly. This mere's looking a little violent and sinuous. What's going on with these mere? We already know. I don't know why I'm pretending it's a mystery. Mirrodin besieged. Like I said right before the last chapter, Phyrexia is back. The plane has been slowly influenced by that speck of oil that grew and divided. The Mad Warden and the Mycosynth were years in the past now, and only the first steps of the plan. And now, the infection has metastasized into a much more virulent and doctrinal form. The infection has spread out from Mirrodin's interior to the surface. The decaying leaden swamps of the Mephidros, that already felt a bit Phyrexian in the first block, became the breeding ground of the infection on the surface, but soon the corruption spread up to every biome on the plane. Mirrens are being infected with glistening oil and truly completed. Phyrexia is growing in power, indoctrinating and recruiting the Mirren population with Phyrexian oil and even more unsavory techniques. Under and on the surface, Phyrexians are terraforming the environment to fit their disturbed vision, and many Mirrens lack the readiness to stop them or even realize what's happening until it's too late. But there are many Mirrens who are ready. Scars of Mirrodin block was sold as the war for Mirrodin, the new and powerful encroaching Phyrexian infection against the Mirren resistance, fighting to protect their homes. The war was the main theme of the block, and the majority of the cards sported a watermark to let you know which faction they were aligned with. The Mirrens are back in all their forms, and in the first set of the block, the influence of Phyrexia was relatively small, with only 16% of the cards featuring the Phyrexian watermark. Compared to the two sets that would follow, Scars of Mirrodin the set felt the most like the original Mirrodin. Despite Phyrexia's efforts already seeming pretty devastating, they were mostly happening in the background, and the majority of Mirrens were too busy squabbling with each other and doing regular type Mirrodin stuff to notice. By Mirrodin Besieged, 50% of the set's cards bore the Phyrexian watermark, the sigil of completion, and the war was on. The Phyrexians were now represented in all five colours, and had clearly expanded across Mirrodin, but now the Mirrens couldn't ignore the threat, and the majority of their cards referenced the war and were positioned as organising against the Phyrexians. Drive them back! Make their underworld into their grave! The Mirren resistance fought for their lives and for their homes. They put aside old quarrels and banded together across factions behind leaders like Jor Kadeen and Azuri. They used their knowledge of Mirrodin to outmaneuver the Phyrexians and funnel survivors away from the conflict. They repurposed tools from Memnarch's regime to fight for their side. Some beings didn't even need to know what the resistance was to be part of it. He didn't have a word for home, but he knew it was something to be defended. And the Mir even helped out. Some of them got completed, sure, but the vast majority of their cards sported the Mirren watermark. Most of those were doing their own thing or kept out of the way, but there were Mir amongst the Mirren resistance. I admire it. Few pull off pluck and subservience at the same time. Azuri, renegade leader. A Save of the Flavor article from the time, also by Doug Beyer, gave us a glimpse into what might drive a Mir to join with the Resistance. Mirrens have recruited constructs, golems, Mir, and other artificial oddities to their cause. Many of these artificial fighters are barely sentient, and fight out of an intrinsic, wired-in sense of duty to their homeworld or to individual commanders. Others have joined the cause more or less voluntarily, moved by their own wordless calculations of value. Even though the more sentient golems or mere may be capable of changing their minds, the duty-wide constructs are thought to be more easily reprogrammed by Phyrexian captors. There's also a note about how Mirren generals have to steer the artifact-crushing ogres amongst their forces towards Phyrexian constructs and away from their own squads of golems and mere. 
Given how the war was the block's major focus and main theme, you'd think the story of the block would be concerned with describing it, but instead, we follow around a bunch of semi-related planeswalkers whilst they do things tangentially connected to the conflict. The main story is told in some comics, and then a book, and then some chapters online. Although all of those things are mostly pretty bad. Especially the book, which assumes you read the first comic and then conflicts with everything in the following comics. And also apparently other stuff from other books that I haven't read. We follow Elspeth, Night Lady, and Venser, Teleport Man, and Koth, the Geomancer, as they squabble with each other and the Resistance, and fight Phyrexians across Mirrodin. Koth is a new planeswalker and Mirrodin native, and brought the other two planeswalkers, who both showed up before, to Mirrodin to help with the war, but they all ultimately decide to fulfil a different goal than fighting alongside the Resistance. Turns out Khan, the Silver Golem, the maker of Mirrodin, has been on the plane for a while now, and is Phyrexia's captive. They've been unable to truly complete him, but they worship him as the father of machines, and he is bound and vulnerable. As the Phyrexian contagion corroded Khan's body, the Praetors whispered psalms to corrupt his mind. Venza believes that freeing Khan is the key to stopping the Phyrexians, and so that's where they direct their efforts. Koth thinks it's a waste of time, but ends up going along regardless. On the journey, they come across a girl who is immune to the Phyrexian oil, and can even cure others of it, so they bring her along to heal the potentially infected Khan. The war is the backdrop of the story, and it's given little focus. The Resistance are even minor antagonists, and the book is very unsympathetic to them. It's weird. The renegade leader, Azuri, who, if you read about him extraneously, essentially saved Mirrodin's elves, and then unified and led much of the Resistance, is basically presented as a villain for wanting to keep the immune girl at the Mirren camp, because she's been doing a good job healing people there. But the planeswalkers want her for Khan, so Azuri's a bad guy. And the only time Amir is mentioned is when the heroes confuse a different thing that's following them for one. And that annoys me, but it's essentially irrelevant in the face of the giant list of reasons that this is a terrible book. And that's a long ass list, but right at the top is how the opportunity to tell the story of the war for Mirrodin was wasted. This was the story for Scar's Block. This was what we got. And man, fuck the planeswalkers. I don't want to hear about them. I want to hear about the Mirren people affected by the war. Show me Kemba, show me Thrun, show me Azuri from an angle that's actually willing to understand him rather than presenting him as a villain because he doesn't want the only cure for the contagion that anyone has ever seen to leave for vague reasons with a bunch of idiots who just showed up. Show me how Glissa Sunseeker became Glissa the Traitor, goddammit! Seems like the kind of thing I'd be interested to read about, but all the potentially interesting perspectives are jettisoned so we can read more about the Planeswalkers. Man, I'm so glad we got to know about Vence's unaddressed drug addiction rather than the conflict the entire block was focused on. Koth, the Mirren Geomancer of the red-aligned Volshock humans, should be interesting, and I like him in flavor text where he seems like a key member of the Resistance. Koth sent partisans into the Tangle to bring survivors to the safe haven of the tunnels below Kuldotha. But in the book and the comics he's just ludicrously unlikable. He's clearly someone who's been entirely worn down by war, but it manifests in him just being abrasive to everyone around him, and the book takes little opportunity to flesh out his point of view. He's just humorless and volatile and has no interest in understanding anyone around him. And he uses violence against his allies to get them to do what he wants. To get Venter to come to Mirrodin, Koth encases his head in stone promising only to remove it and stop him from suffocating if Venza follows him to his home plane. So the best opportunity we have in the book to peer into the mindset of the Resistance is kind of wasted. Rather than attempting to make us understand Koth, the book just assumes we'll be on board with him because his cause is just. I still like Koth, to be clear. He's the only Mirren planeswalker, but I like him in spite of his characterization in the quest for Khan. Despite how unlikable and uninteresting, and apparently contradictory to their previous showings but I didn't read the Time Spiral novels, all our heroes are, they eventually prevail and free Khan from the Phyrexians. Khan's not been fully completed, but he's in a sorry state along the way, and Vensa has to sacrifice himself to save Khan. Teleporting his own heart into Khan to heal him? It works! Now that Khan's free, Phyrexia has lost its chosen figurehead, and surely the Resistance has gained a powerful ally. Mirrodin's creator still lives, still shapes metal, and still commands world-shaking power. Is Khan going to direct some of that world-shaking power towards the Phyrexians and become a warrior of the Mirren resistance? I have slept for too long. Mirrodin has carried my pride and also my guilt. You all have fought my battles. Now, friends, we shall show these beasts of meat and metal the true nature of their father of machines.
But oh, would you look at the time. After bashing in the heads of literally just a few Phyrexians, Khan's off again to have a quick checkup on every world that he's ever visited to see if he accidentally spilt any more glistening oil. I mean, it's worth taking a look at, sure, but the Mirren's ace in the hole, the saving grace that the Planeswalkers chose over helping the Resistance, just left. We will make this right, Koth said. He stood next to Venser's dented helmet. But the others had left, and his words went unheard in the gathering darkness. The book left things up in the air on this ominous note, but separate to being given any concrete conclusions, by the time that we saw the name for the third set in the Scars block, Mirrodin's fate was already decided. New Phyrexia. This had always been the plan for Mirrodin, right from the beginning, almost since the idea's inception. The intention to transform the metal plane into a new Phyrexia had been baked into the original Mirrodin's construction. You know, with the oil and the Mycosymp and the Mad Warden. When Watsi was building Scars of Mirrodin block, the original plan was to have the whole block set on New Phyrexia, slowly revealing that it had been Mirrodin all along. But they figured that would be confusing and wouldn't resonate as well with players as actually showing the fall of Mirrodin. So in reality, there never really was any hope for the Mirrens. They were born, marked, to complete later. Still, compared to Watsi's original plan, it's nice that we got to see Mirrodin one last time, eh? Despite their plans, Wizards did do an excellent job making it feel like the outcome of the war was undecided for the duration. They even mocked up and showed logos, set symbols, and packaging for two potential sets to end the block. New Phyrexia and Mirrodin Pure. Only just before the set's release was it revealed that Phyrexia had won and that the plane had been renamed. Mirrodin was no more, and New Phyrexia stood in its place. The Phyrexian effort to terraform the plane had been ramping up in the background across the block. The Quicksilver Sea was polluted with glistening oil whilst the Necrogen Swamps expanded, and soon their efforts turned to every biome on the plane. These effects were demonstrated across the block's basic lands. Unlike many blocks, Scar's basics had new art for each set. For the first set, the art of the basics combined with each other, and the art of the basics in the set that followed, creating a panorama that demonstrated the spreading corruption on Mirrodin. For New Phyrexia, the basics showed Mirrodin's landmarks, the centers of its cultures, turned to Phyrexian control, whilst also demonstrating the terraforming efforts that were happening under the surface. The Mycosynth towers in the plane's interior have grown up to encase the mana core, whilst they simultaneously branch out to meet each other, weaving together to create vast surfaces within the plane. The Mirren watermark only showed up on a small fraction of cards in New Phyrexia. Most that had it showed Mirrens desperately trying to survive, or throwing their lives away on last-ditch efforts. Anything we can do to hurt the Phyrexian invaders is worth dying for. Most of the Phyrexian cards weren't even concerned with the remaining Mirrens, and the war seemed already decided. The Accorders would lament the transformation of their cherished lands, had they lived to see it. Shieldred, whispering one. Instead, for the majority of the set, Phyrexia turned its attention inward. As whilst Phyrexia had transformed Mirrodin, Mirrodin had transformed Phyrexia right back. In consuming our world, the infectors have become the infected. Yorgmoth's original Phyrexians were all universally black mana, as that was all they had access to back on the original Phyrexia. But Mirrodin was a plane influenced by all five colours, where the five mana suns still revolved around it. The influence of Mirrodin's mana on Phyrexian development created new and different forms of Phyresis. Five separate factions with different methods and outlooks. All still Phyrexian and all still working towards planar completion, but separately adapted by the five colours and their corresponding environments on Mirrodin. Each faction a dark reflection of their colour's typical philosophy, and each led by a praetor, the embodiment of that refracted ideology. The Vicious Swarm are the green-aligned Phyrexian faction. During New Phyrexia, they occupied Mirren's forest, the Tangle, organising some of the first attacks on the surface and completing the vast forests, cultures and titanic wild beasts. The Swarm is led primarily by the bestial praetor Vorinclex, with Glitter the Traitor serving as his general in commanding the Swarm's fighting force. They believe that Phyrexia should be perfected through a mockery of natural selection. That strength can be achieved by eliminating weakness in the wild and never-ending hunt. Predation is the impulse that drives the green-aligned Phyrexians, and whilst they make some surgical and otherwise Phyretic efforts to improve themselves and their creations, they believe there is a limit to the effectiveness of such a direct hand, and that true Phyrexian dominance will only arise from letting their natural savagery evolve and consume Phyrexia's flaws. We do not need beakers and vials to test our predators. Vorinclex, voice of hunger. 
The blue aligned faction is the progress engine. Prior to the full scale attacks on the surface, the progress engine scoured the Quicksilver Sea with glistening oil, and then operated out of the formerly Vidalcan city of Lumengrid after conquering it. Jin Gataxius, the elongated, mechanized Praetor, leads the faction and serves as a storehouse for every scrap of data that he and his Phyrexians have gathered. Under his direction, the Progress Engine believed that perfection will be achieved through clinical experimentation. Like the evilest version of the Simic, they're the most mad sciency of the factions, and they spend the most time vivisecting captive Mirans, and then, I imagine, other Phyrexians. In this way, Jin Gataxius may be the closest of the Praetors to how old Dr. Yorgmoth used to be. As well as surgically experimenting, Gataxius also spends his time writing and perfecting religious Phyrexian scripture, which he bakes into his new creations in the hope of birthing an embodiment of his Phyrexian philosophy. I despise Vorenklex and his slobberings about evolution. Only I know true progress. Jin Gataxius, core auger. I'm not sure if this image is horrifying or maybe gratifying in the tiniest way that the situation allows. This very much does look like a bunch of dead Mia being prepared for Phyresis. And it could be that, but Xenograft makes all your existing creatures the same type. And wizards, I mean Jin Gataxius, chose the Mia to be the type shown on the card. So I think instead this speaks to Gataxius recognizing the brilliance of the Mia and turning other stuff into new Phyrexian Mia. And that's better than him not doing that. See, they look all shiny and new, and I don't think many Mia have spines like that with spiky tails. And there's further precedent for the Phyrexians utilizing the Mia's designs. We will ingest and remake this world in our image. Not unlike some admirable designs I have seen here. Vorenklex, Voice of Hunger. Parasitic Implant grows a Mia out of something else, and Mia Sire is making a Mia in a way that I don't think they typically do. Of course, Xenograph could just be showing us a bunch of dead Mia about to be xenografted into something else, but I don't like that idea, so no it isn't. Phyrexia's black aligned faction is the most divided, as black is the colour most commonly concerned with the personal acquisition of power. That power was divvied up between the seven steel thanes who ruled over feudal territories in the Methodrust Swamp and in sections of the plains interior. They schemed and squabbled, and apparently the era of New Phyrexia that we saw in the set played out as a kind of demented Game of Thrones for the black-aligned Phyrexians, with them all plotting against and fighting with each other as much as the differently coloured factions, all the while attempting to maintain a medieval court-esque facade of civility, with daggers clasped behind their backs. Shieldred, Whispering One, rose to the highest seat of power in the swamp and is the black-aligned praetor. She sits at the centre of a web of spies, assassins, lies and information that she has spun to hold herself above the rest of her faction. She believes knowledge is her greatest weapon and she wields it both as a bludgeon and a precisely applied scalpel against any in the way of her ascent. Whilst they stand divided, if the black-aligned Phyrexians share anything, it's the want for control and the desire to overpower, corrupt and enslave other beings. I believe many worlds will bow to Phyrexia. Mirrodin is merely the first. Shieldred, Whispering One. The Machine Orthodoxy is the white-aligned Phyrexian faction, and perhaps the most powerful amongst them all. During the war, the Razorgrass fields fell quickly as the Leonin and Loxodon were defeated, and the Orthodoxy took root in their conquered lands. Of all their factions, Phyrexia's white-aligned is the most reflective of their indoctrinal religious element, as faith tends to be a white matter concept. The machine orthodoxy operates as exactly that. They're an enormous religious institution with an incredibly literal interpretation of their faith. There's this tiny fly that's been flying around me for the whole fucking shoot, and I, I can't, I can't uh, where is it? Hopefully it's not drop. Please, I don't think you can see it. It's so small. Fucking go away! Sentiments like the elimination of the self will achieve unity translate in action into people being literally sewn together. The orthodoxy is divided into three sects with differing beliefs, but they all answer to the same leader, and they all desire unity with each other and with the other colours of New Phyrexia. Elish Norn, the Grand Cenobite, the Praetor of Unity, leads the Machine Orthodoxy. The hierarch of their structure, and a highly respected figure amongst each sect, Norn also commands the war effort of their vast military force. She embodies the unity that her faction seeks, and wants, above all, not just to unite New Phyrexia, but all of the beings of the multiverse in grand, perfect completion. The machine orthodoxy write and preach religious Phyrexian scripture called the Argent Etchings. All three sects interpret the scripture to their own ends, with Norn presented as the most masterful at manipulating those around her with her delineations of the etched dogma. 
Many in the orthodoxy believed that Khan would lead Phyrexia to glory, and still want to see a father of machines at the top of Phyrexia. And Elish publicly shared those sentiments, but she believes that there is no one more fit to rule New Phyrexia than herself, and that a mother of machines might better serve them instead. We are a single entity. Dissenters must be sutured into the orthodoxy. Elish Norn, Grand Cenobite. The Quiet Furnace are the red-aligned faction, and the biggest manifestation of the problems that Mirrodin's diverse manner brought to New Phyrexia. The original Phyrexia found unity through the singular influence of their plane's singular black manner. The five colours may have brought New Phyrexia a diversity of new strengths, but they also brought a diversity of concepts and ideologies completely alien to Yorgmoth's original Phyrexia. For the first time, Phyrexians had divisive interpretations of completion and divisive visions of perfection. On a more fundamental level than any scuffle Yorgmoth's lessers in command may have had with each other, New Phyrexia was in conflict with itself. Wipe Shieldred's spies from the sky. She'll see the result of our vision soon enough. Glissa. The civil war between Phyrexians wasn't something we got to read about as much as I'd have liked, but seemed to be a pretty cold war, fought more underhandedly than in the fields. Mostly the new Phyrexians ultimately desired unity, or at least control over a united Phyrexia, and most of new Phyrexia's new philosophies could become accustomed to each other eventually. Many of the ideas associated with the Five Colours could be bent or twisted to Phyrexia's will, as I described in the other factions, but not every colour could be so easily reconciled. Individuality, emotion, compassion, and freedom are all inherently red concepts, and all completely at odds with the violently enforced unity of Phyrexian doctrine. Phyrexia's red faction took control of the mountainous Great Furnace, and it served as an entrance to their constructed subterranean furnace layer. They tend Phyrexia's furnaces, toiling to melt down and re-sculpt Mirrodin scrap by scrap, churning out fuel and resources for the war effort and then the mass terraforming of the plane. Whilst the rest of the faction squabbled, they also cooperated with each other and at least feigned civility, but the furnace layer wanted as little contact with the other factions as possible, and only ever offered as much help as was asked and nothing more. Eventually, their praetor, the living machine Urabrask the Hidden, decided to shut the furnace layer off from the other four factions entirely. Seal the furnace vents. Admit no others. We'll tend our forges without their tainted ways. Decree of Urabrask. Urabrask embodies the issues that his quiet furnace faces. The red-aligned Phyrexians are the least in step with Phyrexian ideology, and the most internally conflicted. Empathy is a concept formerly alien to Phyrexia, and conflicting with their inherent violent nature to complete. But under the red sun, for the first time, Phyrexians with the capacity to feel a broader range of emotions, with the capacity to feel empathetic, were being born. For some in the Great Furnace, this emotion did little more than provide brief moments of pause to the suffering they inflicted, but for many others, this empathy grew within them a deep conflict and a shame that would stay their hands even against the Mirren resistance. When Mirren refugees from the war and the tattered resistance were found hiding in the Furnace Lair, the Red Phyrexians looked to Urabrask for decree on how to deal with the survivors. He deliberated for three days in silence and then spoke only three words. Let them be. By the end of the block, the survivors were still camped out in the furnace layer, whilst Urabrask sealed it off to buy himself more time to figure out what to do. We were left at this moment in time, with all the pieces in stasis on the board, as the Mirrens cowered in uneasy sanctuary in Urabrask's domain. The other factions still yet to discover his heresy. Urabrask may suspect our surveillance, but he cannot stop it. Avarikta, Gitaxian Sective. The real stories of the war for Mirrodin or the Phyrexian infighting that followed were never told in any complete or satisfying form, and instead, the Planeswalker's Guide world-building articles that accompanied New Phyrexia, as they do many magic sets, gave us a bit of a clue towards the Civil War, as well as the structure of the Mirren War from a retrospective angle. You could probably comb through these articles and all the cards and all the other stuff to piece together a timeline of the war, and that sounds like fun, I'm probably going to do that in a future video. Engage with me. Tell me if you want that with your words down below. It won't supersede Guildless 3, I promise. That... Ugh, that's next. I don't have any ideas I like better than that right now, so that's next. For real this time. Why don't you believe me? How do you... Why? But regardless, the story was still missing. Not, uh, Guildless 3's. I mean, New Phyrexia's story. As we exited Scar's block, Mirrodin had been entirely lost and was being transformed, but us Mirrens were left with a few faint glimmers of hope. Some scant survivors still scraped by on the plane, and New Phyrexia still stood divided. And I suppose everyone else was happy that, as much as the Phyrexians were aware of other worlds, they were still stuck on New Phyrexia for now. Then? For then? 
Would any of those faint dying sparks ignite into something greater? Or would Phyrexia find a way to get off plane? Time would tell. So let me tell you about what some of that time told. The Fallow Years. New Phyrexia fell on Wizard's back burner for a good few years, whilst magic travelled through a bunch of other settings, and the story focused on other multiverse endangering threats. But as we all know, we've been gearing up for New Phyrexia again, as the Phyrexians reappeared in the main plot a couple of years back. Between Scar's Block's end and their reappearance, we were occasionally drip-fed tiny snippets of info on our transfigured metal plane's current fate off in the background through articles and supplemental products, etc. A story on the magic site from a couple of years after Scar's block ended wrapped up the fallout from the quest for Khan. Ajani, I pray you never see Phyrexia. In a letter that a mentally and physically broken Elspeth writes to her friend but sends to no one, she tells of how her and Koth became separated from the last of the Resistance, including the Phyrexian immune Malira. Elspeth fears they may all be gone. Having lost their companions, the two planeswalkers went to detonate a bomb under the Phyrexian throne room. Before the explosion, Koth encased Elspeth up to her waist in the stone floor, but this time to get her to leave. Elspeth's reflections on her complicated feelings about Koth actually offer him more understanding than he got in the quest for Khan. Through the endless trudge of defeat that she'd seen on Mirrodin that had scarred her body and mind, Elspeth admired Koth's limitless resolve, which she weighed heavily against her own. Through her bleak perspective, we get a sense of Koth as someone who has adapted to live amongst the endless horror that Elspeth almost succumbed to. A man whose life was long since stripped away by war, and now all that remains of him is whatever survives it. If there can be no victory, then I will fight forever. Koth of the Hammer. The blast went off as Elspeth planeswalked away, and Koth's fate was unknown, though we know that no lasting damage was done to Phyrexia. Koth and I were the last natural forms on that unnatural plane, at least that's the way it seemed. Elspeth believed that the Resistance may be entirely lost, but the group that she became separated from, the one led by Azuri, might be a different group from the one that fled into the Furnaces. Though she also gives us some bad news for them. Although the Resistance had limited access to information, we believed Elish Norn had dominated Urobrask and Shieldred's domains. The Praetors were gathering in the Throne Room to select a new father, or Mother of Machines. Phyrexian power is seemingly consolidating under Norn, and worse, She's taken control of the place the refugees were hiding out in. I doubt she took as lenient a stance on the Mirren refugees as Urobrask did. Corsets are annoyingly light on Mirrodin-themed cards, but 2015's corset, sorry, 2014's corset, Magic 2015, came with Soul of New Phyrexia. A grim portent and reminder, but probably not an actual representation of the soul of the plane. Planes have souls that occasionally manifest, but the soul cycle this card is from isn't meant to represent the actual world souls of planes. They're more metaphorical. The yearly run of Commander decks didn't give us much info, but became a way for wizards to continually twist the knife for the Mirren survivors. 2015's gave us Azuri, Claw of Progress. The Mirren Resistance leader now turned to Phyrexia. No word on the other survivors, but it's not looking good. In 2016, we saw Atraxa, Praetor's voice. A new new Phyrexian Phyrexian. A Mirren angel captured by Elish Norn, who then invited the other Praetors to complete Atraxa together as a symbol of Phyrexian harmony. Urobrask was the only Praetor who didn't contribute, which is why Atraxa's missing red. So the Red Praetor is still out of step with the rest, but the other Phyrexians are enough in step to create a powerful icon of their unity. The 2018 decks gave us Bruderclad, Telcor Engineer, the guy quoted on that first gross Mir from years ago. Potentially a former Mir himself, Bruderclad can churn out many more Phyrexian Mir before making even more, or turning them all into something greater. He lacks the Mir type himself, and I'm not sure if Bruderclad is more of a maker or a shepherd to the Mir, but I like that we have a Phyrexian with an affinity for them, at least. Bruderclad's status does seem to remain as from a possible future, but it does speak to the Phyrexians utilizing the Mir into said future. A Phyrexian arena reprint from Conspiracy Take the Crown showed us that the Blast didn't claim him after all, and that Mirrodin's most ardent Planeswalker defender is still alive and still fighting. 2018 took us back to Dominaria, where we got an update on Mirrodin's dad, Khan the Silver Golem. When we last saw him, he was leaving all the Mirrens to die, so he could go and make sure he'd not accidentally completed any more worlds. And apparently, he hadn't, so he came right back to help the Mirrens! No, he didn't. He instead went to go and find a Silex, an ancient, plain massacring weapon. Khan wants to use it to wipe New Phyrexia clean. Koth was right. Saving Khan was an absolute misuse of the Mirrens' time and resources. Khan was never their saviour. 
he's prepared to let every remaining Mirren die to wipe away his mistake. Which may well still be a loss the multiverse will have to accept, but considering Khan was positioned as a potential hero to the Mirrens, it bothers me that the story has never really addressed this as a failure of his. Khan should care about the Mirrens. At the end of the Mirrodin story, he expressed guilt over his part in what happened to the plane and its people, and even considered the idea that his responsibility to them was paternal. When talking to a Mirren, perhaps more in a way, you were all my children, even more than Memnarch. And if Memnarch at least was Khan's child, then that makes the Mir Khan's grandchildren. So apparently the guy who hated violence so much that he swore it off for years has got no problem killing all his grandkids and all the other Mirrens hiding for their lives because of his mistakes. I do not understand your lack of faith. Karn, you are a peace-loving, pacifistic, gentle giant who has vowed never to take a single life. How exactly are you going to be the one to destroy an entire plane of existence and all the living beings on it? I'm not saying Karn's motivations can't change, but it needs to be addressed better and it still hasn't been. Even in a much more recent story, the Mirren's potential demise is shoved in Khan's face, specifically to hurt him, but we hear nothing about whether it actually does. It just feels like he hasn't considered the Mirrens at all. Turns out the Phyrexians in that old trailer were right the whole time. Khan is coming! Savior! <laughs> that was all we had before Phyrexia's re-emergence, but in those preceding fallow years, WotC also gave us a few opportunities to look back at Mirrodin and ponder on what we'd lost. 2016 gave us a story within a story about my favourite little guys, but we'll save that one for later. As I said a minute ago, if the annual Commander decks sprinkled in any cards from the Metal World, they mostly reminded us of the Mirren's doom, but occasionally we had tiny glimpses of the past. See who doesn't love turning their mate's commander into an invincible bug? Only on Mirrodin. Commander Legends was a fun set from 2020, and it would be great to see an actual sequel to it. The real Commander Legends featured more new Phyrexians. A salvage splicer and a flesh sculptor, a thingiform, some of those cool porcelain doll ones having a fun, creepy time together. But also a couple of Mirrens, like Krak, the Thumbless, who lost at least one of his thumbs back in the original Mirrodin set. Double or nothing. 2019's Modern Horizons gave us a representation of the Phyrexian Mirren War on the card Mirrodin Besieged. Look, it's got the same name as the second set from the Scars block, which makes it only slightly harder to find and buy online than Hour of Devastation from Hour of Devastation. Or I guess the Brothers War from the Brothers War. Modelled on the Siege Cycle, which showed off the plane-spanning conflict in Fate Reforged, Mirrodin Besieged actually does an excellent job representing the war in a single card. Either providing you a mere a turn for going Mirren, or an eventual victory for Phyrexia, built upon the defeat of all your artifacts. I like when events from Magic's history get represented as cards, and this is a pretty ideal version of this one. And I love that the Mirrens are represented by Mia. 2021's Modern Horizons 2 came with three brand new Mia! New Mia! It's been ten years. For many of its cards, Modern Horizons 2 looked all the way back to the original, incomplete Mirrodin. Back to the shimmering, addictive nostalgia that I crave. The set came with a bunch of new cards set on pre-Phyrexianized Mirrodin. The most since any real Mirrodin set. We had a load of new Arcbound constructs, a full Jewel Land bridge cycle, this adorable guy, Thought Monitor, which I originally missed from this list, but it's here now, which is crazy because it's both fantastic and gorgeous. And Knighted Mir and Mir Scrappling and Parcel Mir. Not one of them is Phyrexian. Mir Scrappling featured a quote from a Vidalcan researcher from Memnarch's time and spoke to the Mir's dependability and disposability. But the other two both had quotes from Mirren Resistance members, who also recognised the Mir's dependability. This one fights like a Leonin. Jorkadeen but also their disposability. Crack it open, maybe it knows something we can use. Car of Wrist, Mirren Resistance. Parcel Mir definitely heard that, but sadly can indeed be cracked open for information. He even has clue as a type, poor little guy. I want desperately to believe that there are still incomplete Mir amongst the remaining Mirrens, but knowing that the Resistance was willing to objectify their construct compatriots to the point of entirely consuming them doesn't help. That was a long and meandering list of details from the Shadow Years, but we've arrived at the part where New Phyrexia was relevant again! Or we're actually slightly past it. Kaldheim came out a little before Modern Horizons 2, but my video needs structure. In 2021, Phyrexia would go from essentially not appearing in the story to taking an incredibly minor role in the story. And then an increasingly large one. I was mildly facetious. Let's do the next part. I was going to call this part March of the Machines, but that will probably be confusing in the future, so I didn't call it that.
Once Magic Story was done wrapping up a multi-year run of pretty good stories with an absolute flop of a book followed by another just to rub it in. Watsy kind of went into panic mode over the story and cancelled another book they had planned before reshuffling other future plans and reverting back to the old model of releasing chapters online again. Except now they're shorter than ever and kind of worse than ever. Kamigawa Neon Dynasty was okay to be fair, but I wasn't really into any of the stories I'm about to briefly go into, and I'm only gonna briefly go into most of them because the Phyrexians mostly feature mildly, mostly. And maybe I'm just biased towards anything Mirrodin related, but the Phyrexians were a highlight of each story, at least. From Magic's new Viking plane, Valheim, sorry, Kaldheim, the Phyrexians stole a vial of world tree sap. Kaldheim has a world tree that pierces through and connects its many separate realms. The gods of that plane use the sap to brew an elixir that gives them their immortality, which could be bad in Phyrexian myths. Vorinclex himself showed up, gutted the god of the tree, and grabbed the sap, somehow. Because the Phyrexians are supposed to still be stuck on New Phyrexia, right? Sample acquired, it said in that stitched together voice. I am ready to return. Suddenly there was a bright, strobing light in the centre of the chamber. A hissing, sparking red glow that began as a single star and spread slowly into a circle. The circle widened. From the other side of the portal came a sound so unearthly and strange, she almost didn't recognise it as a voice. Welcome back, Vorinclex. We step ever closer to perfection. So as well as some world tree sap, the Phyrexians clearly have some kind of interplanar portal device, and they seem to be working together. Fuck. It seems like the portal only works for the non-meat parts of them, and Vorinclex had to spend some time recovering. But that's like only a bit of them anyway, and they can apparently rebuild from the journey. Kamigawa is where they showed up next. The Japanese flavoured plane where the physical and spirit worlds intersect. Now in Cyberpunk, Jin Gataxius, the sciency blue praetor, went to the plane to try to solve the issue of planeswalking for the Phyrexians. Which does sound a bit contradictory, right? Why did the Phyrexian go to a different plane? So that Phyrexians could go to different planes. Yorg Moth was never able to complete a Planeswalker, and never able to replicate Planeswalking amongst his Phyrexians, a problem that persisted for New Phyrexia. You see, Phyrexians don't have a soul, it turns out. Souls are a thing in magic. Most sentient beings, like humans and elves, have souls, but lots of stuff doesn't, like angels and robots. Phyresis, the process of completion, robs the body of the soul, and Every Phyrexian is therefore soulless. But the Planeswalker spark is contained within the soul or something, you see, so completing a Planeswalker makes them not a Planeswalker anymore, or maybe just dead. Elish Norn challenged Gataxius to solve this flaw, so they could Phyrexianize a walker of their own and get to completing the multiverse already. Lacking fresh Planeswalkers to experiment on, Gataxius turned his attention to Kamigawa's Kami the spirits of the plane that can move between its physical and spiritual realms. So he got himself a lab on Kamigawa for his Kami experimentation, and teamed up with some native mobsters and texters, as well as Magic's recurring planeswalking minion, Tezzeret. Subordinate to a bad dragon man until recently, and now seemingly Phyrexia, although Tezzeret remains incomplete. He actually has a history with New Phyrexia, having shown up in Scar's block pretending to work with Phyrexia, but actually trying to prevent them from uniting, as per his previous dragon boss's orders. Failing to do that, he seemingly mostly just annoyed them, and the Phyrexians were ready to rip his head off, last we heard. But now he's using a planar portal that he's since acquired to help them get off world, so I guess all is forgiven. Living matter that isn't a planeswalker can't survive the journey through the blind eternities though, which is why all the Praetors have had to recover, and why they still want walkers of their own. Despite the efforts of the heroes of the story, it seems like Gataxius' research on Kamigawa was completed. And fan-favourite storytelling moonfolk planeswalker Tamio is defeated and yanked by Tezzeret through his portal to New Phyrexia. Gataxius was only using Kami because he couldn't get his hands on the real thing anyway. Arise, first of the Phyrexian Planeswalkers. You will not be the last. Well, they got her, and Gataxius has done it. Planeswalkers are no longer safe from completion, and the multiverse is no longer safe from Phyrexia. But in the new, shiny Art Deco Streets of New Capenna, Urabrask the Red Praetor also showed up. Urabrask has also been working with Tezzeret, but just like before, he's still out of step with Norn and the other Praetors. Elish Norn has dominated all of New Phyrexia. Jin Gataxius, Vorinclex, and many of the Black Thanes have pledged themselves and their spheres to her grand vision. But I serve no one, and those I lead wish to be left alone. 
We do not share Norn's vision. I will lead a necessary challenge to Norn's control. Tezzeret seems to be helping Urobrask to offset the help he's been offering the other Phyrexians. He's helping Norn because of something that she's promised him, but he does purport to not want Phyrexia to take over the multiverse. Urobrask is seemingly on New Capenna, no, on Capenna, in New Capenna, to investigate a war from the plane's history wherein Phyrexia's forces were defeated. Apparently through utilising the same power that is the city's favourite drug-slash-drink, Halo. It's essentially distilled Angel, so he's looking into that. Urobrask is also looking for additional Planeswalker support in his plan against the Praetors, and he has Tezzeret recruit the magical animal bow-wielding Planeswalker Vivian Reed, and then has her recruit Elspeth Tyrrell, the Night Lady from Scarsblock. And Urobrask really wanted Elspeth on side. All he really knows is that Elish Norn is supposedly afraid of her, but Urobrask puts a lot of stake in this. She is the key to our success. I will not depart without her. Her spark will ignite my people and the Mirrens both. Ah, Mirrens! He said Mirrens! They still have a chance, and maybe there's even an incomplete Mir or two amongst them. It's comforting to imagine. Vivian finds Elspeth for Urobrask, and the pair both agree to go and recruit more planeswalkers to aid in the plan against Phyrexia. We then had a quick story that confirms that Elish Norn is indeed afraid of Elspeth Tyrrell, whom she remembers from Elspeth and Koff's failed bomb attack. Norn sees Elspeth in a nightmare where the planeswalker is incomprehensibly incompletable. The nightmare brought on by the nightmare planeswalker, a Shiok, who just wanted to know what Phyrexian nightmares look like. Norn doesn't fear Elspeth in a <laughs> kind of way, and more of a I will destroy that which I do not understand kind of way. And Norn resolves that to purge this new fear from her mind, she must also purge Elspeth from existence. In September 2022, in Dominaria United, the Phyrexian influence was ramped up dramatically. Now the Phyrexians were the set's major threat, and Dominaria, Magic's original home, was under full-scale invasion by Phyrexia again. Shieldred, the Black Praetor, was restored from her Tezzeret-enabled travels to Dominaria by a Phyrexian-worshipping cult that was already established on the plane. Speeding her recovery and giving her access to resources and bodies that helped her check off her task list even faster. Shieldred's seemingly here for three things. The Mana Rig, an ancient structure that offers immense power. The Silex, that weapon of mass destruction that Khan dug up. And the Digger Upper, New Phyrexia's father himself, Khan. The Silver Golem is the protagonist of the story, and amongst the Planeswalkers who've historically protected Dominaria most enduringly. New Phyrexia has moved on to calling Elish Norn the mother of machines now, but they still have designs on their old dad. Khan uncovers the Phyrexian infiltration early, but gets clonked out and immobilized for months before he can warn anybody or do anything to stop them. Giving Shieldred plenty of time to complete enough Dominarians for a decent army and start destabilizing Dominaria's cultures with Phyrexian sleeper agents. Dominaria United's story is kind of like War of the Sparks in the... I like the idea of it, and I like how it felt on the cards, but the text itself is pretty bad. The tale of the second Dominarian invasion sounds good as a list of bullet points, but the chapters are so short and working with so many pieces that basically every element of the story is choked by its brevity. The characters and the setting and the plot all feel cheapened by not being given enough room to breathe. It's a bit disappointing, but nevertheless, I enjoyed that the larger plot was moved along for Phyrexia. After sending her sleeper agents to damage the political relations of Dominaria's nations, who ultimately play a very minor role in the story, Shieldred, grafted to an ancient Phyrexian war weapon and backed by a massive completed force, attacks the Mana Rig, defended by Dominaria's united people. Khan included. The battle tips back and forth, but ultimately the mana rig has to be set to self-destruct to stop it from falling to Phyrexia. And Phyrexia have another ace up their sleeve. Another fan-favorite planeswalker has been completed. Ajani Goldmane, the heroic Lion Man from the original Law in 5, is a Phyrexian sleeper agent, and his betrayal sees Khan immobilized again and yanked through one of Tezzeret's portals back to New Phyrexia. Welcome, father. Elish Norn's voice was a throaty, pleasing contralto. Welcome home. Right before this, Ajani takes the Silex from Khan and crushes it in his hands, as the Phyrexians have no need for it anyway. They only want it gone. And part of me's kind of glad, because Khan was going to wipe out the rest of the Mirrens. Shieldred retreats through the same portal, having checked off two out of three anyway. Her troops around the Mana Rig seem to be defeated, but there's no telling how many Phyrexians are still left on Dominaria. With Khan lost, Teferi, the Master of Time, another Dominarian hero with a long history, decides that the key to defeating Phyrexia lies in the past, and resolves that he's going to have to do something that he swore he never would, and 
travel back there. The next set in the continuing story was The Brothers War, which wasn't out when I shot the video and managed to make some of my earlier statements about the current story's quality inaccurate by actually being good. The Brothers War was one of the most pivotal moments of Magic's early history and was the focus of the game's second ever expansion, Antiquities. Set thousands of years before the current canon, the story was told in detail in a novel a few years after Antiquities, and few Magic stories are so fondly remembered, at least by the older player base. The two brothers in question, Urza and Mishra, were artificers from Dominaria, who discovered two ancient power stones in a cave. The brothers fought over their greed for the stones, accidentally killing their guardian in the process, and the conflict that followed wouldn't end for another 40 years, and eventually engulfed the entire continent they lived on. What the brothers didn't realize at the time was that the same cave that contained the stones they found also contained that portal to Phyrexia that Yorgmoth had used millennia ago, and that they had accidentally reopened it. Each brother acquired more and more power, soon commanding nations to play out their personal feud and scouring the landscape to produce giant mechanical engines of death. They burned the world down because neither of them could talk to one another. The Brothers' War defined the era of Dominaria it took place during, and no one on the continent of Terrassier was left unaffected by it. On a remote island, decades after it began, the war ended when Urza, seeing that his brother had been entirely completed by the Phyrexians that had influenced both forces, detonated a Silex. Like the weapon that Khan would uncover much later, it may even be the same one, decimating the island and the atmosphere of the entire plane. Mishra was vaporized by the blast, but Urza instead ascended to become a planeswalker, and a sort of main character-ish figure in the game for a while. Thousands of years later, the heroes of the current timeline are looking back at the Brothers' War for the information that they need. The Brothers' War, the recent set, not the book from the 90s, I haven't read that, although I probably will, it sounds good, but the story associated with the recent set is kind of like the opposite of War of the Spark. Although the flavor of the cards was actually really good in both of those sets. What I mean is, the story sounds like bollocks on paper, but the text was really, really good. Oh, it was a breath of fresh air. Our current heroic cast of Planeswalkers have brought each other together to deal with the Phyrexian threat. Just after the recent invasion, they've gathered in one of Urza's surviving workshop towers on Dominaria. Reeling from the loss of Khan, the Planeswalkers plan to take the fight to New Phyrexia coordinating their attack with Urobrask and the Mirrens' planned assault, which seems imminent. Koth and the Mirrens are planning an assault on the Phyrexian core. We plan on joining them once we're ready. Then, together, we'll eliminate the Phyrexian leadership and mop up what's left. Without a head, the body will fail. Kaya. There's debate without resolution about the specifics of the plan, and whether attempts will be made to rescue and restore their completed allies, but regardless, their plan hinges on activating the Silex. Whilst Khan's Silex was destroyed by Ajani, the genius artificer planeswalker Sahili managed to create a perfect replica from the plans that Khan had uncovered on it. Fuck you, Ajani, they got a brand spanking new Silex. And the way the heroes talk, they don't seem like they plan on wiping the Mirrens out with the Silex. I mean, they're coordinating with them, so... They don't go into the plan's specifics, and the possibility of the Mirrens being collateral is brought up, but it doesn't seem like the walkers are going in with the intention to kill the Mirren survivors, at least. Maybe me and the Professor, and I'm sure a load of other people, wrongfully assumed that the Silex Blast would wipe out all of New Phyrexia, and the Planeswalkers can maybe use it in a more targeted way? But it was a fair assumption to make. Urza's Silex Blast was so devastating, it caused an Ice Age on Dominaria, and a bunch of other multiverse-spanning effects. Plus, I remember hearing that Mirrodin is small, I think? I can't find the source for that, but I'm pretty sure New Phyrexia is like... Smaller than our moon, maybe? Don't quote me on that. But anyway, the Silex Blast might not massacre the whole plane when utilized, so should I reevaluate how harshly I judged Khan earlier? Well, my contention that the Mirrens don't feature in his motivations, and he doesn't even seem to feel bad about it, still stands. Why hasn't he saved all the Mir yet? Huh? Why doesn't he care about them? Khan values synthetic life and often relates to machines easier than people, whilst he simultaneously resents being treated and seen as an object. You know who would likely understand living with that specific kind of dichotomy? Your grandkids, Khan. Your grandkids, you negligent monster. I know he's going through some stuff right now. He had 11 years before that. It doesn't change anything. Regardless of the level of destruction the new Silex might cause, the Planeswalker's plan relies on it. But they still don't know how to use it. There's no switch or button. The activation is magical, but they don't know the magic. 
So MTG's resident time mage Teferi is going to have to go back in time and see just how Urza managed to switch it on. The story is told in two sets of five chapters. One set by Miguel Lopez gives us a collection of stories set during different periods of the Brothers' War, giving us empathetic perspectives from characters affected by and fighting in the conflict on both sides. With Teferi briefly appearing at the end of each as he attempts to time travel, back to the right moment. They culminate with Teferi getting it right and talking with Urza in a time pocket right after the Silex detonated. Where Teferi learns that the Silex's activation seemed to be tied to Urza's emotional state and intent, as he regarded his Phyrexianized brother in those final moments. The second set of chapters by Reinhardt Suarez tells the current time story of the Planeswalkers gathering in Urza's tower. The chapters focus on character development, and each shows us the perspective of a different member of the cast. And each are given so much dimension with just a few words. I'm so much more invested in our central cast now, and their motivations and relationships feel much clearer. The plot is very simple. The planeswalkers meet, chat, and then defend the tower from Phyrexians, whilst three of them do the time shit. But the simplicity lets the characters take center stage, and gives them room to fill the space. Every chapter was a delight to read, and it was a great decision to spend this time developing our central cast before they all walk together into hell next set. One chapter even followed Tezzeret back on New Phyrexia after the Khan napping. We learn what it is that Elish Norn has promised him. A new body to replace his current one that is apparently slowly dying from the influence of the attached planar bridge. I'm not sure accepting a new body from Phyrexians is a great idea, but before we can find out, Tezzeret makes a decision. Instead of giving him the body on the retrieval of Khan, as was promised, Norn gives Tezzeret ever more tasks to fulfill, sending him back to Dominaria. Realizing that his reward will eternally be pushed ever further back, and that Elish has no intention of releasing her grip on a pawn as useful as he, internally Tezzeret swears his revenge. Returning to Dominaria to fudge Elish's orders as much as he can get away with, without blowing cover. With a bit of covert help from Tezzeret, the Planeswalkers defend the tower from the Phyrexian assault, and the time travelling yields the information that they need on the Silex. With their nuke now primed, the Planeswalkers all gather to leave for New Phyrexia, and coordinate with the Mirans. But Teferi won't be joining them. Unable to return from his temporal journey, Teferi is stranded on a beach, somewhere and when in time. He only hopes that his friends have the information that he learned. Thankfully, we know they do. So at the end of all their plane hopping over the last few sets, the Phyrexians have a list of ominous pieces that I'm sure they'll combine into a nightmarish jigsaw. What are they planning with all their new toys? Well, some preview pages from a book that only just came out spoiled some stuff mid-2022 and gave us some info. Most of the stuff they spoiled happened shortly after in the Dominaria United story, but the pages also gave us a look at the new structure of New Phyrexia. Mirrodin's hollow interior has been onioned into the nine spheres of New Phyrexia. Worlds within worlds, spheres representing all the colours of New Phyrexia, with Norns more central than the rest. But at the world's heart is the multiverse's greatest threat. Turns out the Phyrexians didn't want World Tree Sap to brew immortality juice like Kaldheim's gods do, they wanted their own World Tree! Realm Breaker, the Phyrexians' incubating invasion tree, seems to be how they truly plan on spreading Phyrexian perfection to the multiverse. And the pages also had some more bad news for the Mirrans, or the people invested in them. The glorious facade encompasses the plane entirely and is New Phyrexia's new surface, whilst original Mirrodin's remains underneath as a barren resource-stripped wasteland. Sad. New Phyrexia looks harder to hide on than ever. Are all the Mirrans just gone? No, because that same page also mentions a few survivors who eke out a life on the plane. Plus, the Brothers' War story makes them seem pretty alive still, and we've got spoilers for Koff and Jorgadine. So, yeah. Phew. Good. And also, Slobat is back somehow, wearing his dead friend. I guess we'll see how that turns out. Even with the Phyrexians destroying their friends and homes, chasing them from their hiding places, and transforming their entire world, the last of the Mirrans still survive. And there's Mia amongst them. I know it. I can feel it. They have to be, right? What's he wouldn't waste that opportunity, right? Right? Anyway, we're up to date. What may not yet be lost. We don't yet know what news Phyrexia All Will Be One will bring, but it's not impossible that it might mean the final, real end to Mirrodin. I mean, the place is looking pretty far gone, but I wanted to make the video now because I needed to talk about my favourite plane and its best feature, the Mir, before we learn that they've all been completed off-camera. 
Do kids even think about the mirror these days? I need to at least make them known before it's too late. Mirrodin just means so much to me, it's still my childhood favourite, and whilst I accept that it's gone, and I don't want it to come back, that would be hacky, the fact that the Mirrodins have never quite died off means I've never quite let Mirrodin go. They're the last surviving shred of my favourite nostalgia that exists in the current canon, goddammit. I need this to be a eulogy for Mirrodin. I need to move on, but whilst there's still a glimmer of hope, I can't. All Will Be One could spell doom for the last of the Mirrens, or worse, the Mir. Or it could begin a resurgence for them, behind the backing of their rebel praetor, Urabrask, And their loyal defender, Koth. Whatever happens, the last surviving Mirrens will likely be thrust into the spotlight once more. Probably just the edge of it, but come on, what's he please? And instead of speculating on what will happen, I'd rather focus on my favourite part of what we may have already lost. In a story by Nick Davidson from Shadows of Innistrad in 2016, the Kamigawan planeswalker Tamiyo told a tale to soothe the mind of a raving Jace. Before she was completed, Tamiyo used to collect tales from across the multiverse, and the one she selected to give Jace clarity was original from the plane that once was Mirrodin. The story is about the Mir, and it goes that after the fall of their creator, the Mir were either left directionless or played out Memnarch's predefined tasks indefinitely. One such Mir who was tasked with making new Mir was left without Memnarch's ability to make each new Mir unique. Still, his instructions persisted. The Mir needed to make a Mir regardless, and lacking its creator's guidance, used its own mind as the blueprint for the new Mirs. After it was made, the two identical Mir found themselves unable to leave the creation chamber, blocked by each other's mirrored movements, annihilation style. Eventually, in frustration, the two destroyed each other. A third Mir, tasked with Mir repair, came to repair the two, but once one of the broken Mir was repaired, it quickly stopped the Repair Mir from fixing the other. The Repaired Mir tried something new and copied its mind again, but this time left it incomplete. And this incomplete Mir was unlike any before it. The newly awakened Mir was able to create others in the same way, and these new Mir, created with minds partially unformed, were able to multiply and modify themselves, act autonomously, and ultimately took the myriad forms that they have today. This was the beginning of the Mir that could think for themselves, that we saw in the Scars block. The ones that could choose to join the Resistance. The Mir even celebrate this story as their creation myth, or at least they did. They disagree on which Mir in the story was the true first of their kind, and what they celebrate most about the story is their ability to have disagreement over it. The fact that they can have disagreements on issues of such a fundamental nature, yet still remain in unison, is at the core of what it means to be Mir. Memnarch built each Mir to fulfil a specific task, and constructed them around that task. They had no curiosity of their own, no longing for anything beyond what was predetermined by their master. They were born complete, their paths already concluded for them. Outside the influence of their maker, born with minds not yet fully formed, the new Mir had room to grow and change and want and form bonds and become the collective of individuals that I really hope are still around. Even if the new Mir don't have memories of their race's previous standardised servitude, their creation myth shows they understand the value of being incomplete and the autonomy it offers each of them. The Mir venerate their diversity of thought, they don't impose their perspective above the rest. There is no answer to that question of which was the first true Mir. Instead, the Mir find unity through valuing the differences that make them all unique. Celebrating the disagreements their autonomy causes for the fact that they can even have them. A complete picture of what it means to be Mir can only be built from many, many incomplete ones. With their incompleteness being so essential to the concept of what it means to be Mir, is there any deed in the multiverse more evil than completing one? Taking the fledgling sentient race that were once nothing but fully realised mindless tools and destroying their newfound freedom and autonomy and returning them to their previous objectified servile state. The Mir want to define what it means to be Mir themselves, but Phyrexia wants to reinstate the old definition. The one that Memnarch had, the one that sees them as nothing but tools. No distinction drawn between them beyond their function. To a Mir, being a Mir is so much more than that. It's everything outside that definition, and it's everything that Phyrexia values least. I probably don't need to convince you that Phyrexia is bad, but even foregoing their definition of the word, Completion is a load of unachievable rubbish. Completion is stagnation. To be complete is to be done, to be fulfilled, to want for nothing more, to arrive at a decision on how life will be and value its form above all others. But as the Mir know well, life is not complete, and to be incomplete 
is to live, to have room to grow and see the value in growth, to change, to want, to wonder, to lust, to reflect, to be open to new experiences and new perspectives and their ability to shape your own. So go out there and be a mere. I want this video to have a happy ending. Take pride in your incompleteness. It's what makes you who you are. You want to be complete? Well, don't, because you can't be. But actually do, not by sadly holding your life against an unrealizable standard, but instead accepting your own incompleteness and the strife for completion as the goal in of itself, as rewarding as it is unattainable. Remember how every story about success is about how its glory is fleeting and unfulfilling and that viewing your life as definitively tied to a goal to complete will leave you feeling empty upon completion of said life-defining goal? Fuck that, it's about the journey or whatever. It's about the parts rather than the whole. Or another equivalent analogy. There's another one that's probably the same thing that fits there, I think. So reject Phyrexia, be a mere, and value the incomplete. You're not yet done, and hopefully, neither are they. Thanks for coming and making it to the end. Oh, I'm so tired. I had so much energy when I was filming yesterday and I didn't sleep. I should really just record this in a couple of days, but maybe tired energy will be enduring in some way. Like all of my videos, I originally intended it to be shorter and just a, sort of a briefer explanation of the mirror. And then I require, and then I realized that the mirror require more explanation <clears throat> and the video bloated into like the history of Mirrodin somehow. It didn't really turn out how I imagined, but I'm quite happy with what it became. I'm supposed to tell you to like the video. So yeah, do that. Um, and subscribe to the channel. And then I'll have more subscribers than I did. And something else. The bell. There's a, no, one, no one talks about the bell, but like, I think you're supposed to ring the bell. The bell's still there. So touch the bell, please. I did the thing that YouTubers are supposed to do and I made a Patreon, so. You can give me money if you want. If you really, um, if you, if you've got too much money and you hate all the money that you have and you would just want it gone, you'd sooner see it gone, I, I can help. I can help with that. I made a big pit on the internet where you can throw your money. Yeah, like, like video, touch bell, other things. I have social media accounts somewhere. Um, I post incredibly rarely on Instagram, but you can go, you can follow me on Instagram if you want, that's there. And I'll post on Twitter more often. If you follow me on it, that's the deal. If you follow me on Twitter, I'll... For everyone that follows me on Twitter, I will tweet once. Oh yeah, Guildless 3. I'm working on Guildless 3 now. Um, I'm working on Guildless 3 now, I promise. Guildless 3 is the next video for real this time. I don't have any other video ideas that I like better than doing that, so that's the one that's on the list. I just, I like, I was, you know, I was more excited about doing Sorin and something about the Mia, but now Guildless 3 has got all of my attention. All right, it's coming, it's next. I promise. What possible reason could you have not to believe me, eh? Eh? Uh, I think I've run out of stuff to say in this video. Where's the Mirari? Right? Where the fuck is it? Like, Memnarch got turned back into the Mirari at the end of uh, Mirrodin. The, the, the original Mirrodin, so then... Where the hell is it? It's not mentioned at all throughout all of Scar's block. And it's just like... Like, that. it's a hugely powerful artifact. It has like a Lord, you know, like Lord of the Rings ring-esque kind of draw on the people around it. So like, literally, it, like, it, like, this thing defined an entire era on the continent that it was stuck on, on Dominaria, like, in the early 2000s. Like, what the... Where the fuck is the Mirari?